I'm good, afternoon. good afternoon. Good afternoon, our speakers. Good afternoon, good afternoon our attendees. I'm Suda Samorn, uh, Professional Affairs and Clinical Education Manager from Medtronic Thailand. Welcome you all to Pelvic Floor Disorder from Basic to Clinical Practice Webinar by Corrective Division, Jhulalongkorn University. Before we start, may I inform some event rules. If you lock it in as attendee, you will only see your name and panelists, and your line will be muted to avoid the distortion during the webinar. But you can ask your questions by typing via Q&A box that you can see uh, the symbol on your screen right now. And for the chat box is for general communication, such as greeting or suggestion. This webinar will be recorded and for privacy and disclaimer, we have requested our attendee, please do not take photo, screenshot, or record this event. Thank you. All right, today is a great honor to have three seasoned speakers to share their experience with us. First of all, may I introduce our course director, a moderator, as well as a speaker, Dr. Jilawat Patana Arun. He is Senior Consultant at Corrector Division, Jhulalongkorn University, and a President of the Society of Corrector Surgeons of Thailand. Please welcome Dr. Jilawat. Dr. Jilawat, please unmute. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Thank you all. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to welcome you all to this special webinar. The title of this talk is Pelvic Fraud Disorder from basic to clinical practice. Someone may have a question. Pelvic fraud lesson is OBGYN work. Why surgeons have to pay interest in, in, this, uh, in this field? I would like to answer that. Now we are in the aging society and pelvic fraud disorder is a common problem in advanced age group. It truly affects our work especially in anatomical work. I believe after this talk, you will understand how important the pelvic floor descent is. Today, we have three speakers. The first one is Michael Park Hai Wong from University San Malaysia or USM. He will be our first speaker. If you give us a talk in the fraud disorder, please welcome Dr. Michael. Very good evening. Thank you, Professor Jira, for the nice um, um, uh, introduction. Thank you, the Chulalongkorn University webinar for the invitation. Uh, I would like to thank Medtronic as well for the initiation of this webinar series. I'm sure that you will have benefited all of us during this um, era of pandemic. Um, it is indeed an honor for me to be able to deliver a talk alongside with my mentor. First of all, I do not have any disclosure. Now, let me kickstart today's talk on pelvic floor disorder. Pelvic floor disorder and pelvic organ prolapse has been a term which we interchangeably use over the years. Um, however, pelvic floor disorder will encompass both male and female. Pelvic organ, while well, pelvic organ prolapse will um, more towards female. In the International Euro Gynecological Associations, they define that any descent of the anterior vagina wall forming a cystocele or posterior vaginal wall forming a rectal seal or UV prolapse from the uterus or the vaginal fold as um, pelvic organ prolapse. However, there is no, there is no um, unified version, especially when it dealt with a rectal prolapse. To date, we are using an Oxford rectal prolapse where we divide the grading system into an internal prolapse or an external prolapse. The internal prolapse were further divided into grade one or grade two, which is a rectal intersusception, and grade three, grade four, a rectal anal intersusception, which we 
commonly called as a partial mucosal prolapse. And last, grade five, which is the external rectal prolapse, which is uh, which you can see the full thickness of the anal, uh, the rectal mucosa prolapse out from the anus. Now, the, the prevalence of a pelvic organ prolapse in the United States, there are 22.7 per 10,000 populations had some form of pelvic floor surgeries, and 13 to 25% of them need a reoperation to correct the, dis the disorder, which causing a healthcare burden to about $1 billion. This is a very interesting um, cross-sectional analysis um, by, by this group, whereby they recruited um, about 16,000 populations into a hormonal replacement therapy clinical trials. So basically what they do is they run a baseline pelvic examination to look out for specific uterine prolapse cystocele and rectocele. And to the interest, we noticed that at least 50 to 60% of them will have some form of pelvic organ prolapse. However, this study is actually limited by a non-validated uh, physical examination. Another observational study by uh, Swift et al, which he recruited uh, healthy individuals aged 18 to 82 years old with, um, with um, using a pelvic organ prolapse quantification tool. This is a standard tool which they use to quantify the degree of the prolapse. They managed to recruit about 497 patients and participants, and they noticed that at least 90% of them would have some form of stage one or stage two disease. However, they could not find out the correlationship between symptomatic and the stage of the pelvic organ prolapse. So if we know that 50% of the Paris women would have some form of pelvic organ prolapse, unfortunately, there's only about 10 to 20% that seek medical treatment. This could possibly be that they do not know who are the best person to look out for, or perhaps we are not looking hard enough, or perhaps there is no awareness on it. I believe that if we are looking hard enough, we will be looking below the tip of iceberg, which is a lot more. An interesting forecast by Wood et al. Um, forecasting that in the year 2050, there will be an increment about 200%, which is 9.2 million of symptomatic pelvic organ prolapse. So I think from now on, we have to prepare ourselves to deal with uh, pelvic organ prolapse or pelvic floor disorder from now in order to embrace on that 9.2 million will be coming to us. So classification of pelvic organ prolapse has always been championed by our urogynecology colleagues. Um, they dealt with um, UV prolapse, cystocele, rectocele, and they have come up with a series of um, classification system over the years um, the Poggi system, the Braden Walker halfway system, the Pigeon system, and I think the most systematic uh, way of uh, quantification of pelvic organ prolapse tools is actually introduced in 1996, which is called POPQ system. In this system, you will be able to see that um, they station all the prolapse area, looking at these pictures, the A point and B point from the anterior part it's written there plus three, meaning that there's three centimeter outward from the hymenal ring. And the B point is actually uh, plus six, which is six centimeter outside the hymenal ring. Basically, it means that there is an anterior prolapse, either from the vagina, wall, or a cystocele. And you can see from the other pictures, these are posterior prolapse, most likely secondary to a rectocele. In the full vagina prolapse or uterine prolapse, you should be able to see the C here, outside here. So the documented C should be a plus two or plus three, which is uh, denoting how many centimeters outside from the hymenal ring. This is a very good clinical assessment uh, to, 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 to quantify the degree of severity of pelvic organ prolapse. Now, the, the pathophysiology of um, pelvic organ prolapse are of a very interesting one. It's usually multifactorial. 
We know that childbirth is at risk because of the overt stretching of the floor of the trauma to the levator and eye muscles or to the nerve that to the levator and eye muscles due to stretching during childbirth. The pregnancy due to the hormonal changes, there will be a collagenal uh, changes which causing the ligament to be stretchable, more stretchable, more distensible, hence um, risk of a pelvic floor disorder. Assisted delivery has a two times odd ratio of um, getting a levator NI muscle uh, trauma, which will lead to pelvic floor weakness and disorder. Obesity, those who have a BMI more than 20, 25 will say it's to be two times at risk compared to those who are normal uh, body weight. Uh, this is possibly due to the constant increased interabdominal pressure that uh, exerted on the pelvic floor leading to weakness. Previous pelvic surgery, this could likely because of the injury to the musculature or the nerve supply or to the ligaments that surround the pelvic floor region and the organs. And last, the constipation. We do not know whether which comes first, whether it is the prolapse causing the constipation or it is the constipation that causing the prolapse. But we do know that with increased intraabdominal pressure due to constipation, as the year goes on, there will be at some point that the pelvic floor will get injured. And especially when you have advanced in age, that the pelvic floor become weak and prolapse, causing prolapse symptoms. In the pathophysiology of uh, pelvic floor disorder, they have this very interesting genetic inheritance that run in a dominant fashion and incomplete penetrance. Those who are, who are in uh, Hispanic and European descendants were said to be at higher risk of um, getting pelvic organ prolapse compared to those uh, African and Asian descendants. This could possibly relate to the pelvic outlet size and also the thickness of the endopelvic fascia and the ligaments surrounding uh, the, the organs that uh, sits on the pelvic floor. Those who have a connective tissue disease, hypermobility syndrome, hypermobility syndrome like those who have uh, Marfan's or Ehlers-Danlos will have increased risk of pelvic floor disorder as well. So this is the compartment of a pelvic floor. The pelvic floor is um, lined by a very thick musculature, which is formed by our levator and I, where it's your ischiocostigias, um, the iliocostigias, the puborectalis muscles, all these lined thickly on the pelvic floor, supporting all the organs that uh, sit on top of it, the amidstrule, such as your rectum, the urethra, and the vagina. In male, the symptoms of pelvic floor disorder are less severe and they, most of them um, presented to you as um, prolapse rectum or perineal descent syndrome because they do not have that the vagina, the genital hiatus, which occurs in female. Apart from this thick musculature, we also have ligaments that surround. These ligaments are the urethrosacral ligaments, the annals costigial ligaments, the rectal vaginal, the puborectal pubo-urethral ligaments. These ligaments are like seat belts that holds all, all the organs in place. And when there is a displacement of these organs due to increased intraabdominal pressure, it should be able to help them to recoil back to its original position. The analogy of this pelvic floor muscle and the ligaments is as if those three persons sitting on the, on, on, on the seat on, at, the, at the back of the car, where the cushion is the levator and eye muscles, and the seat belts are the ligaments that surround it. At any point that either the seat belts torn or the, or the cushion torn, it will cause prolapse. And when the organ prolapse, it will cause functional problem to the organ itself or to the surrounding adjacent organs. So when we talk about pelvic organ prolapse or pelvic floor disorder, we have to think about what are the functional problems that comes with it. When we dealt with um, pelvic floor disorder, we have to look for pelvic floor dysfunctions. We divided it to three compartments, which is the anterior, central, and posterior. 
The anterior look for urinary incontinence symptoms. These are involuntary loss of urine due to stress, urgency, even sometimes continuous, or even during coitus. Look out for bladder storage uh, symptoms. They will have um, overactive bladder. They have got increased frequency during the daytime or at nighttime causing nocturia. And some of them also will present to you with sensory symptoms. They will tell you that they don't feel that the bladder is filling up. Either there's an increased sensory or reduced sensory or absence, or in more severe condition, they may have awareness of the urinary bladder fill up that leads them to have this strong desire to void. In voiding symptoms, this is almost like our the prostatism experienced by male. They get these obstructive symptoms where they get hesitancy, they get um, slow strain, they need to strain to urinate, they have to get to, into certain special position to urinate effectively, and they can also get urinary retention. They also experience some form of uh, post maturation sim uh, symptoms, such as uh, dribbling, such as the feeling that they need to revoid after urine, after complete of urination. So as the retention occurs, they will at some point present to you with recurrent urinary tract infections. So those who have a recurrent urinary tract infections, please look out for it for pelvic floor disorder as well from now onwards. As the prolapse person, the lady will come to you with um, the feeling of sensation of vagina bulging. They can get um, pelvic pressure, and as the pressure at the prolapse worsen, they will lead to um, bleeding and repeated uh, vagina infection, and sometimes cervical uh, bleeding as well. As the prolapse um, of the vaginal vault or the the urethra or, or the uterus is severe, it stretches on the pubic retalis, stretches on the levator ani, and leads to chronic pelvic low back pain. Some of these ladies will come to you with uh, complaints of social dysfunction or specifically sexual dysfunctions. They will tell you that they get some form of superficial or deep dyspareunia. They have problem of vaginal laxity. They have problem with obstructed defecations, ob obstructed intercourse, I beg your pardon, obstructed intercourse because of the prolapse um, organ. So we look out for anorectal dysfunction symptoms. I think it is very important to look out for this because it causes a, a very specific um, uh, deterioration in the quality of life, especially when they have to digitate, when they have to uh, digitate in order to remove the feces. They come to you with obstructed defecation, constipations, they may come to you with flatus fecal incontinence. From flatus fecal incontinence, we also have to look out for whether it is true incontinence or is it because of sphincter injury that causing this incontinence. These uh, patients may also come with rectal hypo or hypersensitivity. And when the prolapse become worsen, they may cause bleeding. So what are the functional assessment tools that we know of? We know that uh, our urogynecology colleagues have come up with a very nice um, uh, pelvic floor distress inventory um, and also pelvic floor impact questionnaire, which help them to embrace and to assess on the different items on, of the pelvic floor disorder towards the quality of life towards and they're able to look into what are the distress, which are the components which is severe, whether it is the urinary distress or the pelvic organ prolapse distress or the colorectal anal distress, which is more, and how do they impact on physical activity, social activity, travel and emotional health. However, in this uh, questionnaires, it, cons it is quite heavy laden. It consists of 46 items for pelvic floor distress inventory and 93 items for pelvic floor impact questionnaires, which requires about 23 minutes or roughly about 30 minutes for completion. So the same group of uh, co the authors actually come out with a short, shorter version or short forms of them, which they shorten to 20 questions and to seven questions. 
This is a fairly good tool for you to, ask, to use to assess pre and post treatment. So the investigation will be covered by the next speaker, uh, Dr. Titinan. Um, I'd like to just to highlight to you the importance of other investigations such as the Eurodynamic study, the annual manometry, because you will be able to, to, to detect an early stress urinary incontinence or detrusor over activity or under activity. This is to help us to help the patient to shape the, expect, the, the expectation after the surgery. If you have a patient with a detrusor over activity, perhaps an early um, post-operative initiation of anti muscarinic agent will be helpful to help them. And if those who have detrusor under activity, perhaps an early education on clean intermittent self catheterization will help them to improve the quality of life later on after surgery. So the management, of course, when we dealt with management of pelvic floor disorder, the pelvic floor are muscles. So the first thing that we should always think about is physiotherapy. The pelvic floor muscle training um, is a series of uh, physiotherapy that helps to improve structural support and pelvic floor and to prevent the pelvic organ descents. Basically, in this pelvic floor muscle training, um, the patient will be taught how to um, contract the pelvic floor muscles when there is straining. This is to prevent the pelvic organ from descent. So the largest, most uh, rigorous uh, trials that is available now concluded that you will need at least six months um, to see the true benefit of pelvic floor muscle training um, in the improvement post-intervention. To me, I think pelvic floor muscle training should be there all the time, despite uh, before or after the, 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 the therapy. How about the role of pessaries? The role of pessary, it is still useful, especially those who refuse or waiting for surgery. We know that uh, the advantage, it could be able to help us to predict whether this patient will have a good outcome after post-operative, uh, after the pelvic organ prolapse surgery. It also helps us to unmask certain occult stress urinary incontinence to help us to intervene early. The challenge to pessaries is that related to device compliance and also complications such as neglected device and vesicle vagina fistulas. So the problem with it is we do not have any consensus um, to conclude that which is the best pessary or which is the best fitting methods to help uh, all these ladies with pelvic organ prolapse. How about corrective surgeries? We have a lot of mortalities in pelvic surgeries which is uh, done by urogynecology colleagues and also correctal surgeons. The transvaginal approach is uh, one of it, which they attempt to fix the vaginal vault or the ligaments around it to the surrounding ligaments, such as your sacrospinous ligaments and uh, iliocosigous uh, ligaments. These procedures is slightly at a higher risk of urethric injury. They approach from transvaginally. And also as we fix it to the sacrospinous ligament, sometimes it can cause sacrospinitis, which leads to chronic uh, back pain, which will further impair in the quality of life of the patient. Compartmental repairs, these are much more friendly and easier to use, easier to learn and reproducible. The anterior compartment repair, such as anterior coprography and paravagina repair, they, it is easy to repair the cystocele, but uh, they have a very high recurrence rate, about 60%. The, as for rectal seal with a posterior coprography and site-specific techniques, these are very easy to learn, very reproducible, with a fairly good recurrence rate, about 4% and 11%. However, all this compartment transvaginal, transperineal repair, it comes with a slightly higher um, problem which related to uh, deep with dyspareunia, which the patient complains. So the current gold standard for complete pelvic organ prolapse is sacrocopopexy. Sacrocopopexy is a procedure approached transabdominally with a mesh placement on the dorsal surface of the vaginal wall 
and uh, fix it to the sacral pulmonary, and the mesh is completely uh, retro peritonized. Uh, peritonized, sorry, intra peritonized. So this is one of the best. It yields a successful rate of 78 to 100 percent, with a very low reoperation rate and very good um, recurrence rate, and they do not come with um, if a very low risk of post-operative stress urinary incontinence and dyspareunia compared to vaginal, uh, vaginal intervention. So how about those with rectal prolapse and pelvic floor disorder? How do we, how, where are these patients? These patients are often um, dealt separately previously um, by uh, colorectal surgeons. So this is a very interesting paper published two years ago in the disease of colorectal, the disease of uh, colon rectum journal, where they look into um, the repair, the recurrence of the rectal prolapse repair, comparing abdominal and perineal repair. In those women, we have a pelvic organ prolapse. And if you can see from this Kaplan uh, Mayer um, graph, those with uh, abdominal repair have a, have a lower recurrence rate. Hence, they, they mentioned that those patients who have a pelvic organ prolapse were associated with higher rectal prolapse recurrence and earlier recurrence. They concluded that in those patients who have a POP rectal prolapse with concurrent pelvic floor disorder, we should try to offer an abdominal approach, either suture rectopexy, uh, not resection, suture rectopexy, or what we're commonly doing now, um, uh, ventral mesh rectopexy. How about combination? The combined rectopexy and sarcopopexy, is it safe? Yes, it is safe. This is a paper published again two years ago. They're looking into concurrent correction of all the compartments. It is safe. They concluded there is no difference in 30-day operative mobility in looking into complication related to wound, reoperation, uh, or re-emission. But in this paper, it was limited by the, they do not look into the long-term outcome. The long-term outcome was published by this group, Jalad et al. Um, this study is limited by a retrospective uh, design. However, they managed, they, they published um, an, an overall morbidity of 25%, but this 25% are all managed conservatively without reoperation. And when they look into the patient re patient re-evaluation of pre and post intervention, it is a very positive uh, subjective outcome. So the take home message from my lecture today is, first, the goal of treatment should not only be anatomical and functional, it should also be quality of life, the health related quality of life. Looking into patient expectation, looking into the patient reported outcomes and the tools that we can use is the short forms of that PFID and PFIQ uh, that I have shown earlier. Or earlier in this, um, this year, January 2020, I think SCRS has come up with an impact questionnaire which we will be able to use to help to, um, to encompass both male and female patients with a pelvic floor disorder. Pelvic floor muscle training should always be the fundamental of our treatment. Compartmental repair is easy, so we can use it, but bear in mind that it is not ideal. Sacrocopopexy is uh, the best with uh, the best outcome in terms of anatomical and functional outcome. And so perhaps per the patient with rectal prolapse with coexisting POP should be offered to do an abdominal approach repair rather than perineal approach. So the gap question that we all face now is how do we tailor and individualize a treatment to address both functional and chemical corrections? I think that the way, the way forward is through a pelvic floor disorder, MDT and regional collaborations. I think we have to start now in order for us to embrace that 9.2 billion will be coming to us in the year 2015. Thank you very much. I'd like to, to, to express my thank you to all the, the, the mentor that I have been with and those inspiring that have continued to inspire me. Hopefully that in the future, we will get to collaborate in the field of pelvic floor disorder. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Thank you for the excellent work as always.
during the transition period, uh, we would like to uh, keep the electronic for special support. Especially video, so as the these two vendors help protect uh, surgeon. Yeah. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Today I'm going to talk about role of MR difficult graphy in pelvic floor dysfunction. I'm Dr. Titi Nanjunara. Pelvic floor dysfunction is frequently multi-compartmental. Clinical examination frequently underestimate the number of compartments involved. MR difficult graphy is a robust tool that enables simultaneous visualization of all three pelvic floor compartments. MRI provides accurate information for preoperative planning to minimize the risk of recurrence and repeated surgery. The advantages of MR difficult graphy are that it lack of ionizing radiation and providing high resolution of soft tissue contrast is a non-invasive study that real-time dynamic evaluation of all pelvic organs in multiple planes. It helps to identify the size of organ prolapse, improve evaluation of posterior compartment, intersubception, and dyssynergification. Indications for the the MRI study are that patients with manifestations of multi-compartmental weakness, the patients who underwent prior surgical repair or recurrence, pelvic organ prolapse, fecal or straight urinary incontinence, symptom of rectal outlet obstruction, and dyssynergic defecation. So the female pelvic organ is divided into the following three compartments. Anterior compartment composed of urinary bladder and urethra, middle compartment containing female reproductive organs, and the posterior compartment consists of anus and rectum. We do MR difficult graphy in 1.5 or 3 Tesla post magnet MRI in supine or lateral decubitus position. We fill the distal rectum with 300 ml and fill the vagina with 50 ml of ultrasound gel. No oral or AV contrast, not need to NPO or bowel preparation. MR difficult graphy should include static and dynamic images. The dynamic mean that imaging under maximum stress to the pelvic floor. The bladder should be moderately filled, therefore avoiding about one hour before exam. Fully the bladder may inhibit the degree of straining and defecation. For static images, we do T2 weighted image in three planes, sagittal, coronal oblique, and axial oblique planes parallel and perpendicular to anal canal to evaluate pelvic floor anatomy. We can see that the rectum lumen is distended from rectum a uh, rectal gel that is hyper-intense on T2 weighted image like water. This is an axial T2 weighted image from superior to inferior. Normally, the vaginal should have normal S-shape or butterfly-shape configuration. The puborectalis muscle form U-shape, sling around the rectum, 
And we can see this is peric urethral ligament and pubo urethral ligament. And on axial images, pubo coccygeus and ileo coccygeus muscles seen like fan shape from pubic bone to the coccyx. In older patients, the, the levator ni muscle may appear thin. However, no test should be ident identified. This is coronal T2 weathered image. You can see iliocoxygeous muscle is convex in upper direction like a seagull and quite symmetry. This is external sphincter and this one is internal sphincter. This is a case with thinning and fatty degeneration of internal sphincter and external sphincter causing anal canal widening. And another case with palpable nodule at ANS after squat, you can see that disruption of left external sphincter and left puborectalis muscle, it loss of normal U-shape. The, for the dynamic study, we perform after baseline resting study in mid-sagittal image. That we will see the low signal of pubic symphysis, urethra, vaginal apex or cervix, anal canal, and coccyx in the same plane. We will do light senior image one frame per second. The steps of dynamic scan include pelvic squeezing, that is Kegel maneuver. For the squeezing, sequence time is about 30 seconds. Squeezing phase provides information about the pelvic floor muscle strength, particularly puborectalis muscle function. And then we will instruct patient to bearing down for straining and defecation with maximum effort and repeat evacuation until the rectum is empty. Sequence time is about 60 seconds. Straining phase provides information about uh, the competence of internal and external sphincter. So we will do MR interpretation. You have to know the PCL. H line and M line first. We use HMO system to for evaluation. H line represents anteroposterior hiatal dimension. M line measures the pelvic floor descent and O classification for the organ prolapse. So for the analysis, we start from mid sagittal image. And the first step is to draw the PCL, that is pubococcygeal line that represent the pelvic floor level. We will draw it from inferior border of pubic symphysis to the last visible coccygeal joint in mid sagittal plane. And then H line, H line from inferior border of pubic symphysis to posterior wall of rectum at the level of anorectal junction. AIJ defines as focal angulation between inferior aspects of levator plate and superior aspect of puborectalis muscle. M line is a perpendicular vertical line from PCL to the most posterior aspect of H line, that is ARJ. So for this line, H line shouldn't be exceed six centimeter in normal patient. So six to eight centimeter is graded as mine. 8 to 10 is moderate and more than 10 is severe pelvic floor widening. And for M line, it should be not exceed uh, 2 cm in normal patient. 2 to 4 cm is my pelvic floor descent. 4 to 6 is moderate and more than 6 is severe. For the organ prolapse, it's measured perpendicular from PCL to reference point of each organ. And I will talk to you later. The severity of organ prolapse can be graded according to the rule of three. Descent below PCL three centimeter or less is considered mild. T to six is moderate, and descent more than six centimeter is considered severe. The levator plate angle is posterior midline condensation of iliococcygeus muscle anterior to the coccyx. Normally, it's parallel to PCL. The caudal inclination of levator plate more than 10 degree indicate pelvic floor relaxation. This is a dynamic study in straining and defecation phase. We will measure in more severe image. In this case, 
S line, H line is measure about 9.1 cm, that is moderate periodic hiatal widening. M line is about 6.1 cm, that is severe periodic fluorescence. And this is the angle, elevator plate angle. Anorectal angle is an angle between central long axis of anal canal and posterior wall of rectum. Normal range is roughly about 110 to 130 degree. In healthy patient, the ARA become more acute during squeezing and more obtuse during defecation, about 50 to 20 degree. Next, uh, then we will analyze uh, pelvic floor pathology in each compartment. Start from anterior compartment. Organ specific reference point is bladder neck or bladder base. It depends on which one is lower. Since the still diagnosed when the bladder neck or base descend more than one centimeter below PCL. And grading, we, for the grading, we will use rule of three. If it large, it causes posterior displacement of middle and posterior compartments. In this case, cystocele is about 3.7 cm below PCL, so that is moderate degree. And next, uh, for urethral hypermobility, is a functional condition that when you rest, uh, the urethral acid is vertical. But in urethral hypermobility, we will see an anterior rotation of urethral axis into horizontal direction more than 30 degrees. When abdominal pressure is increased, that is straining and defecation phase. This is a dynamic image. You can see nicely seen the cystocele that is moderate degree and the urethral axis from vertical to anterior horizontal axis. And in this case, you can see anterior rectal seal to For the middle compartment, we will measure the organ specific reference point is anterior most anterior inferior aspect of cervix. And if the patient has hysterectomy, uh, we will use posterior so social superior vaginal apex. For the grading, we also use rule of three for, for prolapse severity. We will see in this dynamic study, you can see that this uh, we will use anterior inferior aspect of uterine cervix. And is it does say that about uh, 2.3 centimeter, that is a uh, mild degree of cervical uterine cervical prolapse. And in this case, you, you can see anterior rectal seal too. And in this patient that his rectal me, you can see this is vaginal apex. You use postural superior aspect of vaginal apex. And in defecation phase, you can see descent of vaginal apex below PCL. And you will see severe cystocele CO2 in this case and my degree of peritoneal CO2. Okay, and a portion of pelvic peritoneal sac that herniates into rectal vaginal space below proximal one third of vagina is peritoneal CO2. The content could be mesenteric fat, small bowel or sigmoid colon. Because the space occupied by the distant rectum during defecation, the hernia become evident only at the end of evacuation after emptying of bladder and rectum. So in this case, there is moderate peritoneal seal. We will measure perpendicular to PCL2. And this is uh, my degree of enteral seal that is small bowel. This is a dynamic image. You can see the rectum field with undersound gel. And this is enteral seal, severe enteral seal, and posterior peritoneal seal. Again, here it is. 
is the sending of small bound and peritoneum. This is another case of peritoneal seal and sigmoidal seal. You can see this my degree of peritoneal seal and sigmoidal seal here, less than three centimeter. You will curious that is this bow loop, small bow or sigmoid colon? You can see from this uh, sagittal T2 weighted image that is sigmoid colon extending from the rectum. We can confirm that it is sigmoidal seal. For the rectal seal is abnormal bulging of the rectal wall beyond expected margin of normal anorectal wall. First, you should uh, draw the line that imaginary line that anterior margin of anorectal wall. So we will draw another line perpendicular to this. This is anterior rectal seal. Anterior rectal seal is due to a defect of rectal vaginal fascia and the posterior rectal seal is less common due to defect in anal costigial ligament. It's not that you should include anterior dark signal intensity when you measure because this is air or fecal content in the rectal seal. Otherwise, you will underestimate the degree of rectal seal. For the grading, we'll use rule of two. Less than two centimeter is my degree of rectal seal. Two to four centimeter is moderate degree and more than four centimeter is severe degree. This is an example of anterior rectal seal. That is my degree, moderate degree. And this is posterior rectal seal. We found anterior rectal seal is more, more, more common than posterior one. Then intersubception is invagination of rectal wall into the rectal lumen and or anal canal anteriorly, posteriorly, or circumferentially. Low grade intersubception is enfolding of rectal mucosa alone, whereas high grade is full thickness, invagination of mucosa and muscular layer of the rectal wall. Rectal prolapse is the most severe grade of full thickness wall invagination and eversion of rectum beyond anal sphincter. And the defecation sequence should be repeated until the rectum is empty to exclude intersubception because it will seem at the end of evacuation. So this partial thickness, non-obstruct, intrarectal, intersubception, this is a full thickness, it's called obstruction. And this is severe grade of full thickness rectal intersubception, that is rectal prolapse outside anal canal. Okay, this is a dynamic image of partial thickness intersubception, folding only the mucosa. And this is enfolding mucosa and muscular layer of the rectal wall. This is full thickness intersubception. And this rectal prolapse, you can see the first stage is full thickness intersubception and then eversion of the rectal wall outside the anal canal. Again, this start from intersubception and rectal eversion. You can see cystocele and anterior rectal seal also in this case and also posterior peritoneal seal. Descending perineal syndrome is a generalized pelvic floor muscular weakness, which resultant in a excessive descent of pelvic contents in all three compartments. On resting MRI, the level of the anorectal junction below the PCL is highly subjective of this diagnosis. You can see in this case for anterior compartment, that is, there is a moderate cystocele and moderate uterine prolapse and peritoneal seal in middle compartment. And for posterior compartment, there is severe pelvic floor descent that is in line. 
you can see in this dynamic in dynamic image of uh, evacuation you can see severe pelvic floor descent and cystocele uterine prolapse and also intersubscription and anterior cell. Uh, spastic pelvic floor syndrome or uh, dyssynic signification or uh, you can call anismus is a functional outlet of traction characterized by, by prolonged or no defecation associated with paradoxical contraction of puborectalis muscle. You can see this in resting stage, ARA, and this is a straining and defecation phase. ARA should be obtuse or increased in straining and defecation phase, but in this patient, it's the same or more acute. So, if no evacuation of rectal content at all or delay evacuation time more than 30 seconds to evacuate two thirds of the rectal content, anismus should be considered. For MRI, other MRI, MRI findings are that failure to increase ARA in, defic in defecation phase, narrow anal canal, prominent puborectalis link, upward bulge of levator plate and lack of pelvic floor descent, that is M-line. It's not necessary to see all findings to diagnose anismus. Sometimes you see only three or four findings. Is another case, you can see narrow anal canal and not increased ARA after defecation. Because the patient defecates in supine position, so we will question that the patient cannot evacuate from inadequate straining or the patient has dyssynergic defecation. We can differentiate between this condition by if you see the swell urine flow in the urinary bladder, that means adequate straining effort. So in conclusion, MR difficulty has a great diagnostic reliability in preoperative planning, providing detailed anatomy and function. Accurate assessment of all compartments of pelvic floor is essential in surgical planning to minimize the risk of recurrence and repeated surgery. Thank you for watching. Thank you, Dr. Tibinan, for an excellent talk. I'm sorry to, uh, I missed to introduce her. She is an abdominal imaging specialist at the Department of Radiology, Raloko University. If you interest in MRI, both uh, MRI program and MRI for cancer, you can come visit her at the radiology department. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My talk today is how pelvic floor descent affects my practice. Please keep in mind, this is not a lecture, just a 
experience sharing. I want to share my experience about the very foundation that affect my practice. It may be right or it may be wrong. It hasn't proven yet, but I believe I'm going in the in the right direction. I have no disclosure. How will it protestant affect my practice? We all know that the protestant plays an important role in in our world, and the protestant is a degenerative condition. When we are dealing with degenerative uh, condition, the best or the most important treatment is the big problem muscle training. Until now, there is no definite recommendation in treating anorectal disease with a periprodesin. My scope is the periprodesin with the, that I change my practice. I will start with the anorectal examination, the conferential of prolapse hemorrhoid, non spastic chronic enough feature, recursive surgery, solitary rectal ulcer syndrome, rectal prolapse, and Brutus and I. Look at the first one. Before I put my finger inside the anus of the patient, I will always ask them to push. If you see this picture, uh, the picture like it's the movement like it's can see the docking down of the anus and the outpouching of the tissue around the anus. It names as ballooning by Professor Park from St. Martin University. It means that you are dealing with the fraud descent. During pushing, you may see the uh, octan polas. On your left hand side, you can see the hypermobility of the urethra. On your right hand side, you can see the rectal prolapse and uh, cystosis. So, we start with Uchi before putting your finger inside the anus. For the circumferential prolapse hemorrhage with peripheral look closely to the anus. Really pushing, you can see the Ballooning. At the same time, you can see the prolapse hemorrhoid with some part of rectal microsoft prolapse. In this condition, my practice is starting with the peripheral muscle training for six weeks to three months. And then I will schedule this patient to surgery. It may be hemorrhoidectomy. If if possible, I prefer an occlusion to cervix operation, either razor or hemorrhagic relaxation, if possible, especially in incontinence patients. For the non spastic chronic anal feature, you can see the chronic anal feature on your right hand side. And during pushing, I notice that there's a ballooning and dropping down of the sphincter muscle, sphincter complex. And the manometry show that this patient has a low resting pressure. So we call it as a non spastic chronic anal feature or hypotonic chronic anal feature. Another case. You can see the ballooning with uh, two features. And you can observe the weakness of the sphincter muscle. Uh, this patient told us that he has had a uh, anosex regularly. So for the treatment of non-spastic chronic anal feature, I always start with very strong muscle training. And then I we try to collect the real causes. The most common causes is repeated injury from 
chronic straining, obstructification syndrome, or NSAIDs. If consultative treatment is failure, I prefer the more Iceland craft of each vector Anyway, please don't do sphincterotomy in this kind of patient. Uh, this is an off with line uh, diamond craft. The next condition is a uh, rectal seal with prefrontal After uh, from Michael talk, rectal seal is the most common presentation of prefrontal But the indication for surgery don't relate to the prefrontal It's the big problem. So. My practice is for the rectal seal without definite pelvic floor descent. I start with pelvic floor muscle training, six weeks to three months. And then I will follow with a rectal seal repair if the symptom improve. Anyway, patient must have the feeling of fecal trapping inside the anterior rectal seal. For the rectal seal with the uh, modulate to severe 24 descent, uh, literature said that 65% had concurrent with multiple organ collapse. So the treatment is a little bit different. We need the imaging for correct diagnosis. So we need an MR lithography. And then the for muscle training. After three months, we consider ventral rectal therapy or photosly depends on the imaging result. Look at this. It's a, uh, it's a shallow rectal seal. If you see the arm pouching around the anus and obstructification like this, don't do rectal seal repair. Because the people always stuck around the ballooning area. For severe rectal seal like this, it's a very deep rectal seal. It always comes with an arterial control lab. In this case, MRI shows rectal, rectal, uh, rush rectal seal, 34 SN and brush rectal anal in past subjection. For the uncommon condition, the solitary rectal ulcer syndrome. The most common cause of solitary rectal ulcer syndrome is Repeated trauma may cause by digital evacuation and also obstructification syndrome or psychotic. I always start with a pre-form muscle training and we advise patients to stop digitation and try to make the stool stop. The other common cause of the SIUS is rectal prolapse or rectal anal infarction. Again, pretty from muscle training is a must. And we consider left ventral rectal pepsi. I want to show the, another chart trick. You can notice the ballooning around the end. And patient here has a history of physical evacuation. Sometimes there is a lot of blood with a finger, around her finger. So caused by Repeated trauma from digital evacuation. But the main cause is obstructification syndrome. Again and again, pretty from muscle training symptoms, stool softening, and stop digitation. And another cause of uh, SRUS is a hidden rectal collapse. 
So we need a MRD program. And we consider uh, let's make sure it's okay. Too. After a bit from muscle exercise. And for the rate of prolapse, we modulate to zero field for the same. Especially in male, we have to start with a field from muscle training. And the bone mesh lab assisted when from rectal testing. For rectal full lab, we uh, modulate to zero field for the same in female. Most of the cases presented with multiple compartment prolapse. We always start with three four muscle training and then left assisted focus swing. For male, I prefer double mesh, one at the back of the rectum and another one is a standard ventral topicity at the anterior rectum wall. And I always pick the bracket to the inner side of the, the abdominal wall. Why I have to add the posterior mesh fixation? Here this is a patient who underwent standard left ventral vector Shortly after that, there's a posterior rectum wall collapse. That means anterior sling, anterior ventral vector is not enough. So I add a posterior topexy. In this case, I went back with the transmitter approach, pull the posterior rectum wall up and pick with support to blast and support venous both sides. And it works well. Another case is a severe periprodescent, huge, and light spatula, uh, spatula and as and severe SRUS. He got two operations before. The first one is uh, the role. The second one is on my operation. And make uh, a So I use a uh, double mesh technique. He's quite young, so I use a uh, biologic mesh. It's protocol. One side at the posterior rectum wall. Another side, okay, sorry, this is a posterior rectum wall fixation. Fix the stitch the protocol to the posterior wall of the rectum at uh, just above the anorectal ring. And the another, another side, I fix the protocol at the S4. With, uh, normally I use the uh, hacker for the Anterior side, I fix the protocol with the anterior rectum ball, and the other side, I fix at the S1 or S2. The MRD program compare before and after surgery. Left hand side is the before surgery, right hand side is the after surgery. On the right hand side, you can see the severe phase for this end and with couple left. On the right hand side, it's a perfect result. For with couple left, we must to see the phase for this end in male, in female, sorry. Before the operation, there's a rectal collapse with cystocele. In this case, I did both of them. One mesh at the posterior rectum wall, and another mesh at the anterior rectum wall and posterior rectum wall, and the last one at the between entry a vaginal wall and bread uh, neck. And I always fix the dome of bread to the abdominal wall. Here for the 
limited budget, we have to use the uh, foreign mesh at the back of the NS for the infra abdominal wall mesh, we use thermocol. One fix at the anterior rectum wall and posterior vaginal wall. Another one, another limb, I cut it in wide shape. Another limb, fix it at the anterior vaginal wall and post, uh, and the uh, rectum neck. And when we cross the posterior abdominal wound, we hang the red wall to the abdominal wall. Uh, this video compared before and after the operation. So we got a, an excellent result, both functional and anatomical. The last one is a uh, Kuretus and I. It's not, a, it's not a common condition, but it's quite common in, in our top reading. If you see this video, the top, top video, you can see the ballooning and wide open of the NS, and you can notice the mucus around the NS. So, for Kuretus and I, in, we can see the context. The main treatment is pelvic floor muscle training or second nerve stimulation. But second nerve, like second nerve stimulation is quite pricey and it's not uh, available in Thailand. I would like to finish here. I cannot conclude, so I choose a, a take home message. I would to say that pelvic floor nursing plays an important role in enorical disease. And pelvic floor muscle training is the key. Until now, there is no definite recommendation in treating enorical disease with pelvic floor nursing. Thank you for joining us. Please keep in mind that ASCRS 2020 is coming. Like Presentation is on September 30 to October 3rd, 2020. Please come join us. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Jilawat and Dr. Titinan and also Dr. Michael. We have uh, some questions from the floor. Yeah, the first question is, uh, since you prefer annual cushion sparing surgery, what is your opinion on stable hemorrhoidopexy for circumferential prolapse hemorrhoid? The stable hemorrhoid is very good for circumferential prolapse hemorrhoid, especially in the patient without uh, pelvic floor descent. You can you should choose the patient properly. For the patient with uh, pelvic floor descent, uh, you can you should start with a key care exercise of pelvic floor muscle training. When the muscle gets stronger and stronger, and no, and the patient improve with uh, improve from constipation or obstipation, you can use the staple hemodectomy. All right. Thank you so much. And for the next question is, uh, what is your surgery of choices for partial mucosal rectal prolapse? If the prolapsing part is only the mucosa, we can do uh, hemorrhoidectomy, the same as hemorrhoidectomy. If it's a circumferential mucosal prolapse, we have two options. Hemodical, radio hemorrhoidectomy or short segment the wrong operation. Personally, I prefer radio resection as hemorrhoidectomy. Thank you. And the last question is pelvic floor exercise is the main first line treatment in this type of pelvic floor disorder patients. 
Do you see market improvements in your patients after this exercise? And how can we make it more effective in your experience? Uh, I would like to ask Michael to answer this. Dr. Question. Michael, Michael, please. please. Right. Um, I think from the literature and from the Cochrane review, we all know that um, you need about six months to see the true uh, effectiveness of the pelvic floor muscle training. In my patient, when I was in Thailand, um, we could see that there is market improvement for those even with um, with a sphincter mouse sphincter injuries. When we subject them for uh, pelvic floor um, pelvic floor muscle training, you can see that the bulk of the muscle will become thicker. And it makes the subsequent um, repair much more easier. So I think that in order to, how do we make it more effectively? I think make it more effectively is to explain to the patients that it is not only the training at during physiotherapy, but it should be a continuous training throughout the days just like which I have shown in the picture, even when you are opening a bottle of wine, you will try to squeeze and try to, to try to, to learn to, to use the pelvic to, to use to contract the pelvic floor muscle to strengthen it all the time. Make it into a routine. So it becomes a natural process rather than a painful uh, process of uh, physiotherapy. Thanks a lot. Another question coming in uh, is pelvic floor training the same as biofeedback. Michael, please. Dr. Michael? Right, pelvic floor, pelvic floor muscle training is different from biofeedback. Right, now biofeedback study, biofeedback study or biofeedback training is a training for pelvic dyskinesia. It helps you to teach the patients when to relax in order to have an effective defecations. While well, pelvic floor muscle training, it's a series of exercises which help to strengthen, to squeeze the muscles more effectively during straining. It is not to make, sometimes it may make things worse if you have a patient with an obstructive defecation syndrome. But biofeedback treatment is a treatment which is designed for obstructive defecation or pelvic dyskinesia, and it is not uh, really for a pelvic floor disorder patient. Thank so they're you different. Much. They're different. All right. Thanks a lot, Dr. Michael. So, uh, Dr. Jilawad, any like topic that our panelists would like to discuss more? Uh, Dr. Dr. do you have any comments? If you have. Can I can I add something, Prof. Jirawat? Yes, please. Yes, please. While, while waiting for Dr. Titinan. Um, you know, regarding the questions uh, regarding partial or uh, partial mucosa prolapse. I have experienced even use a rubber band to help just, uh, you know, when we're doing a rubber band bending for hemorrhoids. I noticed that some of my patients does have some degree of improvement. I, I give them a rubber band in um, a circumferential rubber band, just like we do in hemorrhoid bending. And then I send them for um, pelvic floor physiotherapy. I think it helps by somehow that uh, they do not need to come back really for, um, for a lot's procedure or my procedure later on. What, what do you think about it, Prof? I agree, it works. The problem is you, uh, this kind of patient need a multiple banding. And if, if, uh, if the collapsing part is just a small area, banding is the hero, no need for surgery. Only for bending works very well. Uh, it's depending on the picture or type of the prolapse. If it's a circumferential prolapse, I believe surgery may be the best. But surgery should come after pelvic floor muscle exercise. Thank you. 
So any comments or suggestions from Dr. Chi Tinan? Okay. Uh, my suggestion, sometimes uh, MR difficult graphy is so hard that the patient can defecate on the table of an uh, MRI machine. So the key to success is that you have to tell the patient before examination that what are they going to do. You have to teach them for a key kegel maneuver for straining and defecation that you do uh, this uh, again and again, maybe three to four times to maximum effort of the patient. Uh, we have a question for Dr. Titinan. Yes. Uh, is there a big difference between the sitting position MRI and radar position MRI, MRI program? Yes, of course. Uh, sit down, uh, sitting position MRI, we, have, we do that in uh, 0 0.5 Tesla in open magnet MRI that we don't have this machine in our hospital. But uh, it's good for the patient that is a physiologic defecation, but the resolution of the image is lower than closed magnet system. So if the patient can't defecate in supine position, we, next we will do the lateral decubitus position that is better. Thank you. All right, so thanks for all the speakers. Before we end the sessions, for the, for the better improvements in the future, may I request all the attendees to give us the feedback of this webinar. I would in like to, oh, sorry, on. I would like to thank all the attendees, all the speakers and Metronic our best friend who support us all the time. And we hope we can go up together in this field. Thank you very much, Metronic. Thank you so much, Dr. Jirawat and all speakers. Yeah, uh, for the closing remarks and thanks for all the talks, uh, excellent talks today. So the, may I request all the attendee to give us the feedback of the webinar. It only takes a couple minutes for these surveys to better improvement in the future. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.